It's my great pleasure to give you an overview on more on the global political, economic, social side. Our specialty is finding out where technology goes and what this has as an effect on human behavior. So the title, I think, is, uh, is very great. Our money, our banks, our countries first. What does it mean when you say our money? What does it mean when we say money? Money today is moving rapidly, and you saw it in Uli's chart, much more towards complex software, towards digital data. This is a huge difference. We do not understand yet. Banks, what does it mean when you say our banks? Banks are now experiencing probably what Bill Gates famously said in 1994, banking is essential, banks are not. With ever more disintermediation, it becomes much more easier for other operators, call it Amazon, Alibaba, to be also part of the financial systems and taking market share away of, of banks. So you can call it in a formula, we are witnessing retail sanity, wholesale madness. Countries are moving now towards weaker nation states. Globally, with the exception probably of China, weaker nation states and fragmented governments. Nation states might prevail, but they are losing power continuously. The shift is now towards connected cities. The real economic powerhouses are connected cities that basically don't need any hinterland anymore. They are very strong and they attract the brightest minds, they attract the talents, call them the global nomads, call them also denationalized elites. They don't care about the specific nation. They don't feel attached to laws in a certain nation. They optimize their career. And of course, you cannot forbid that. It's okay. But this changes the rules of the games, and this changes the rules of the nations. What does it mean for regulation in countries? We don't know, but probably we will see more regulation. And the question is, what kind of regulation will we see in the future? I'm going to argue basically the tech, or more precisely the use of data, data aggregation, and data analysis is already sort of a second economy, a superstructure that works above the established economy. Tech now stacks the established economy. It is setting the standards not only for organizational patterns, it is setting the standards for business models, for productivity, and even for wealth creation. So digital tech, and especially data, is the referee, you might say, when we try to create order or disorder in our liberal Western democracies. But for the first time, and this is re really new, with ever better tech infrastructure like cloud and massive computing power, we can, for the first time, now really leverage the potentiality is, you know, artificial intelligence is a very old idea, very old technology, but we can leverage only today with massive computing power, uh, with, with cloud computing and robotics and blockchain is possible today for the good or for the bad. When you also, when you look at any kind of businesses and the financial industry is just, is just joining the, the crowd, all major innovations over the last few years have probably been software-driven, software innovation, or at least software in disguise. So when we look at the most innovative ca uh, companies, the most, most innovative countries, you see that those who can learn faster, those who can adopt new technologies better, they are more agile, they are more innovative also in catering to people. Who is in charge? It's very difficult to say. I guess that technology is now becoming more important and more important than ever before. Last year, this place, Axel Weber, German of UBS, had a speech and he said, well, large financial institutions, we are already technology companies. Take whatever you want, and you know the figures better than me, but when you just look at how much finance is now being automized, how much you see in transactions that is fully automated, and it goes up and it goes up. When you look at the automotive industry, probably the business model of the last century, uh, you see that we are step by step entering a new ecosystem that is software driven, data driven. We are moving with ever better sensors to self-driving cars. If you make the parallel, I think it might be appropriate to say that finance is now marching towards self-driving finance and self-driving investments. So it is even correct to say that we are becoming more and more the machines we are creating. The famous quote you probably are familiar with from Marshall McLuhan, the Canadian media thinker, prophet, who said, we shape our tools, 
and after all, our shul tools are shaping us. So we are becoming the machines we are creating. So what I call smart technocracy, we are moving towards a more technologically driven system. It might go in one direction that is more anarchistic. It might be democratic. That's what we all hope. But when we look to China, we see that technocracy in a totalitarian uh, disguise is already here, and it's very strong. And I'm not sure what kind of system might win. So we are back in the old game of what is the better system for the future. And for sure, we need a deeper discussion. Uli said it already. We cannot leave these, these discussions to the techie guys. We cannot leave it to, the, to the, the, the finance economists or to the bankers. This is something that concerns us all. Probably the best quote I found recently is that trust is now moving away from human beings and human institutions more and more moving towards in code we trust. I think the quote by Tim Wu, a law professor at Columbia, who says the reason to think something deeper and more important is there is reason to think something deeper and more important is going on. Bitcoin, just as a case study, Bitcoin's rise might reflect, for better or worse, a monumental transfer of social trust away from human institutions backed by government to systems relied on well-tested computer code. It is a trend that transcends finance in our fear of human error, or we, we are putting an increasingly deep faith in technology. I think at least, if you think seriously about that, we can, when we analyze our own behavior, see how we deeply depend on tech and how trust is shifting. When you look at the most innovative companies, companies that have the most consumer trust, most often is already a technology company. Why? Because they solve a problem I have in my everyday lives. So it's nothing abstract, they solve a very concrete problem. You might not love Amazon as, as, as a citizen, but you pretty much love Amazon as an investor and as a com consumer, because they deliver and solve a problem. <clears throat> so the Bitcoin case is an excellent case to see that it is not just about what the mainstream narrative says. It's, of course, it's about speculation. It might be a bubble, it might be greed, it might be hurt behavior, but much more interesting is that this is just a sign that we are losing trust in human institutions and we believe that God is more, 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 uh, can be more trusted. So when we look back at the dot-com crash in the late 90s, it was, time, it was the time when completely new business models emerged, when we learned how difficult it is to measure productivity appropriately, and it was the time of weak, untested, unexperienced tech that was still underpowered and hardware driven. Today we are rapidly moving toward from a hardware world to, to, the, to the software world and hardware is not and, and, uh, and software is no longer the prisoner of hardware. Also when you look back the, the last 20 years, the best companies that emerged at that stage were not only surviving, they are the strongest now in business globally. Think Amazon, think Netflix, think Priceline, think Google. So again, when we look at where trust goes, it becomes clear that all this, uh, this, uh, this better tested code is having an important impact on personal trust we feel towards brands and towards companies. Even in healthcare and mobility, we put more and more trust in code and well-tested computer code. So in the end, it boils down to the question, where is trust going? Where do we to put uh, trust into? So again, take any statistical long-term analysis, take the Edelman barometer that always comes out for the World Economic Forum. We see that trust is moving away from humans and who human institutions more towards well-functioning, trusted uh, code and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and technology. Or just think of uh, what's happened with the hashtag Me Too or with President Trump, what these phenomenons, movements, and persons do to the trust in males. The trust in males is declining. So again, this is a blow to humans. And when you no longer trust humans, we have serious problems in operating also on, the, on a political base. 
What is going on? Finance just seems to keep up with the broader trends, and I think that is, uh, that is true when we look at all the human errors we witnessed during the big meltdown in 2007 and 2008. So prov provocatively said to a computer programmers, ladies and gentlemen, the financial system looks a bit like untested code with weak debugging. Uh, it looks a bit like untested code with weak debugging. So again, even if you think, and I think that's correct to say, trends like Bitcoin might not be the future of currencies or the way to invest for the many. But it is a symptom, and it shows certain alternatives that might get better step by step as the continuous improvement of software will help us to prevent bigger failures. Just compare also the learning curve of humans, compare that to the learning curve of well-functioning technology. So this might also mean that data-driven services could be the core products in the future. So when you look at what data does, basically data brings us cognitive services that we, no longer, we do not yet know what the clear value of that is. When you look back, we said, looking at the banknotes, in God we trust. This was the expression still available in US coins and banknotes. You can say in the industrial world, we basically trusted more and more in expert knowledge, or we trusted in leadership of great leaders in the political arena. But today, we get a, you get a sensitivity for the huge changes witnessed over the last two decades. In code we trust, Larry Lessig said, uh, uh, Harvard law professor uh, is probably becoming, to say, say it really provocatively, is becoming more important. Code is law, is the best formula I ever learned. And it works. In all our studies we did, we can confirm for, that for regular people, ordinary people, the regular population, convenience is very important. So it just works. It is convenient, it is simple. Yeah, I have simple access to something is the most important for people. Probably not for experts, they think about it, but for people, it's, it's, it's how practical it is and how easy it is to manage. This is the most important. So again, a citizen you not, might not like Amazon, but basically, as someone who uses the tools, they are quite good. So to finish the Bitcoin case, the first Bitcoin billionaires, the twin brothers, Tyler and Cameron Winkle was, put it, Bitcoin is not the new gold, it is more than that, it is a programmable store of money. That's very, very well said. It is a programmable store of money. And it made my continue to innovate. And again, when we look at China, I think China is the most advanced in all these issues. If you want a simple binary change of mindset, we are always talking about paradigms, that's true but it helps to simplify things. We might say we are moving in a data world out of the old industrial world that is coined and framed by scarcity. We are moving to much more abundance because as we now derive data from people, from animals, from plants, from machines, from things, from any kind of, 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 of possible data, data bearer, so we see also that we are moving towards a much more software, consumer-driven logic, and when you look go down also, I think that the next step will be we will have more a world of continuous, small, controlled improvements, a pragmatic learning culture, and going away from the old temporary big disasters with extended recovery kind. If we get the tech thing right, very visionary, wise spoken, we can have a better future. The old world is basically, can, you can put it into metaphors, tanker and silo, the new one, it's also a little bit dangerous, I agree. Drones and cruise missiles. But again, when we look at the big revolutions, technological revolutions in humanity, it were only, basically there were only three. The first one was the written language, the second one was money, and the third one now is data software. And software is probably much more powerful because you always have to ask, how can you store something how can you transfer it and how can you multiply it? Then it becomes obvious that, of course, data 
is even more powerful than any kind of money you might imagine. But this is a different mindset. And I will give you just one quote, looking at the clock, just one quote that sounds quite geekish, but it's from an MIT professor. It looks very technocratic, but I think it shows the mindset of the techie people. And he says, David Clark, at a conference in 1992, just before the internet really become, became mainstream, how they operate when they just code, when they make programs. We reject kings, presidents, and voters. We believe in rough consensus and running code. Of course, it's always humans behind the code. But nonetheless, the key is a practical, operational working system that can quickly adopt be implemented, and you're continuously learning by small steps. How you have a rough consensus means you have strong views, but weakly held, because you adopt, you adopt, you have strong view, you know the direction, you know you make a mistake, and then you adopt again. And at least in theory, we do have the computing power to go in that direction today. We like a GDI always to do maps. When we don't understand something, we try to create maps. And when we look at how disruption really works, we said we need to take into consideration two things. One is, what is the state of technology? But even more importantly, what is the social acceptance of a certain technology? Sp out, uh, outspoken or, un, uh, or, or just, uh, uh, just un, uh, not outspoken, you might say the mindset, the social acceptance is basically the key whether we move ahead with technology or not. And also, when you look at sovereign money, it becomes clear we have a lot of theory. I think the technology it's envisioned, probably prototype, it could be applied, probably, but if you don't have the social acceptance. And this means, on one side, on the technology side, do we have enough research for the theory to put it into practice? And on the other side, for the mindset, do we have the social acceptance? And to gain social acceptance, ladies and gentlemen, you need what? You need better communication. So in order to look at what's going on, you have to have a clear vision of what's going on in the, in the field of social acceptance in a, demo, demo, in a democracy, a democratically legitimized background. So you have different phases you go through, and then we see you can only have disruption huh? and get a mind shift if you have the according mindset. I think that's very important to see. And then we can understand what it takes until something is just far out, not socially accepted, controversial, a niche. And then it moves over. Huh? Many in, in technology, you can see that how fast, for example, the iPhone mobile commerce became naturalized incredibly fast because it solved the problem, and socially, it was highly accepted. But without that, if it is not socially accepted, we need much more communication and a better understanding. And it should not be uh, just restrained and confined into the, the, the elite discussion. So when we look at what's going on over the history of money, and um, we, just ta we just talked briefly about it, we see that we are moving towards Something that tells us the more we become a complex world, the more we are technology driven, the more we depend on basically trust. We lend trust to something we do not understand. So we need the courage to experiment and to try out. This is the case with technology. Uh, you see that basically progress is the result of more trust in ever more abstract, advanced technological systems. It's fascinating also when you see old technologies. Huh? You can call ca cash a technology. Cash is not that. Cash is even stronger than ever. So this, show, this shows also that a lot of people have high interest in cash, that it not only prevails, but probably even becomes stronger. So new technology does not necessarily wise mean that all technologies are fast dying away. They might remain. But I want to point out another interesting thing. We used to say that we take something at face value, how you really trust. The more we move deeper into the complex digital eco ecosystem, the less we talk about face value. The face is basically disappearing. We move from face value to interface value. So trust in the interface is becoming the real asset 
in a global digital economy. So when you look at the battle of the biggest platforms, the biggest technology companies, you see he who, who defines the interface wins. So the biggest battle right now is about conversational technology. But with, because with tech, conversational technology, you just need to talk and no longer to write something down, to operate the machine. This is just the next step of convenience. And when you look how fast Alexa, the conversational technology of, uh, of, of uh, Amazon, is gaining trust, you see that it is gaining momentum, and then we are in a new, new ecosystem. Think back 15 years, ladies and gentlemen. 15 years back, only people said, I'm never ever going to buy something in the, on the internet. Huh? Amazon books, no, no, no. That's too dangerous. That's not safe. Thanks to Amazon, this is no longer a question. So it, show, it shows us how we can move quite fast. Or also when you look at Alibaba or the, the big Chinese guys, they are heavily investing in all interface values. They are in, interface, in interfaces. For example, they are investing in bikes because then they have access to the payment system and then they can control the interface of the user. So it's all about who has the, the best access to the interface of someone because this is the easiest way and the most convenient way. But wait a minute. We must be aware that data also changes the nature of, of competition. Look at the, the big companies. And data quality, of course, is, the, is key. With artificial intelligence, we can perfectionize data by extracting more value, especially also in real time. But the challenge is, each of these data classes is also a new asset class. But what is the pricing model behind it? And here we can clearly see, as long as data has not an appropriate uh, uh, price, as long as it is not categorized, as long as we have no reliable model behind it, without, you might call it, infonomics, data owners always win. And you can easily predict, as long as the big guys are not willing to be more transparent and to open up for a, for a pricing model for the data, we as users produce, their value might go up more and more. So we are degraded as data producers we produce the data basically for free. We get nothing for that. And that is also a scandal. But what we are given, it's cognitive services, and it's highly valued because it's, it has a high, a high value in our practical lives. But those who can really produce, and not, the producer has, has not the chance to be in the driver's seat, but those who can aggregate the data, they can, who can analyze, they have the most power right now. I will not go deeper into that, but now the question is, what kind of structural change are we going to witness over the next years? Is it really true that we are going to have, even with blockchain, more decentralized systems, a more decentralized approach to, to, to transactions and all the things we like to do in an easier way? I'm not so sure yet. I'm not so sure yet. There are, of course, many visions. Uh, the thing is, big visions rarely come from within a certain business or a certain system. So the vision for self-driving cars is not an idea of Volkswagen or, or General Motors, and the idea of blockchain was a, not an idea, the idea that grew out of HSBC or JP Morgan. But the, f the funny thing is, you basically need one strong person with a strong vision, and then you can just shake up a whole industry. So this was the case with Elon Musk, and of course this was also the case with Bitcoin, with uh, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, the name used by the person who invented Bitcoin. So one person alone can be extremely powerful. And that is basically good news. But on the other side, when we have more and more trends towards, towards decentralization, we always see a strong counter trend towards new sorts of power structures. Just, I don't have the time to go into detail, but I think, again, a very good quote uh, from the Square and Tower new book by Neil Ferguson, who says, the lesson of history is that trusting in networks 
to run the world is a receipt for anarchy. That's very interesting. So my guess is that we move towards a combination of more networks, but also more control and hierarchy, even in the Western world. Let me go toward the next point. What is the result? Are we moving to more towards digital Maoism or digital anarchy? A little bit also democratically underlined. Are we having more big data and central technocracy or free market and a scary situation of weak, low trust government institutions? Probably you know that China is establishing a powerful tool of fixing and predicting future failures better and, and, and uh, acting preventively. We have to acknowledge that China is far ahead in terms of use and speed of execution when it comes to digital tools and businesses of any kind. How stable that is, is another, another question. But at least they have a clear idea. They know what they want. We don't. We don't at all. And again, the pace of innovation, no longer just copying or stealing, Experimentation and adaptation, learning is very breathtaking. Just to give you one example, I could cite the hundreds. China now accounts for more than 40% of global e-commerce transactions, up from less than 1% a decade ago, according to the McKinsey Global Institute. So that's absolutely breathtaking. And with his social credit score, it can monitor dysfunctional, inappropriate behavior. It started with individuals who apply for a credit. And giants like Tencent, Alibaba, and our JD.com are obliged to share their extremely detailed data about all the individuals they gather with central authorities like the People's Bank in China, meaning its central bank. Imagine that for a Western nation. Then, but this is not, not done yet, the, the People's Bank shares this data with about 50 state-owned banks and this creates a database that covers approximately 400 million people. That includes all the consumer patterns, product preferences, payment histories, social media communications. Huh? This is a chart originally established by uh, the Wall Street Journal, another great publication after the Financial Times. All this helps to establish knowledge about bringing down household debt, so they very cleverly try to establish predictive tools to bring down household debt. And Chinese consumers and employees now know that credit scores matter for their personal future. This is the privacy issue, of course. Be better in tune with standards that, that uh, set, standards set um, uh, than pile up debt, because it might affect your career. Now, when you register today in any kind of, uh, as an employee, you have face recognition. When you uh, go into a church, you're being recognized, and it might hurt your credit score. You can still apply for a mortgage, but your interest rate might be higher. This is how the flexible system in China is going to operate right now. It is said that this not yet finished. It is said that a similar system is going to be established also for companies. So the People Banks of China's credit reference center is in charge. This will cover a wide range of data, like account information, company social security payments, housing provident fund payments, administrative penalties and awards, tax arrears, and court judgments to assess whether a company is a good corporate citizen and a healthy credit risk. This helps to prevent debt addition and systems failure. The Western narrative, on the other side, is that central planning will sooner or later fail. This might be true. But it is a little bit more unclear when you see all the tremendous opportunities and possibilities we are going to acquire with ever better technology. Of course, manipulation and corruption might still prevail. But can we take that for granted for the future? We in the West must, furthermore, also appreciate that we are already going in the same direction. Take insurance companies that now can fix the annual policy in accordance to the data available about your behavior. How you drive, for example, is easily monitored. Take elderly people, take the young, so you can, uh, you can, you can uh, apply and uh, discount a certain policy or have a premium on it. 
how you exercise can be much easier monitored, and it gives you access to cheaper health insurance. How you protect your home now with Google Home and all these Alexa systems, for example, against burglars, it can be monitored. This will bring more transparency, but also more hyper-personalization, but it implies a move away from all-style risk pooling. So in the end, and this is my conclusion, I'm exactly like, nearly like a Swiss clock, the results are going to be in the direction the same. As we expect huge efficiency gains, we just implement what is technologically possible. And China is, as I said, ahead in the speed of execution, so we can learn from their mistakes also. So provocatively said, Pax Technica is slowly arriving. We just do what we are told to do by ever better tech. So we cannot say what tech is going to tell us with artificial intelligence, but we know we can adapt, we should take the best out of it. And I think this is a very fascinating time, and I hope we have good discussions. Thank you very much for being with us.